Um, so we can, okay. we can get ready to go. So thank you for that. Oh, did I hear something? That was Vernice saying hi to Peggy. Okay, hey, hey y'all, hey everybody. So thanks for everybody who's been on the day and who's been to hang out all day. This has been, a, a, I think, a great first day. I know it's been a little long today. It's gonna be longer next week. Uh, so just to, before we move to this, to this session, I mean, we have uh, three more days of uh, sessions, uh, the 26th, uh, October 3rd, October 10th. But this session I'm really excited about. Of course, I'm excited about every session. Uh, but this session is entitled A Syndemic. Uh, and just to let y'all know, uh, I took that word from Adrian, but who took it from Vernice, but I really only been getting credit to Vernice. So I'm gonna get credit to Adrian for introducing it to me first. Uh, but A Syndemic, 400 years in the making, uh, toxic racism, toxic climate, uh, toxic pollution, and toxic viruses. This is a discussion with the National Black Environmental Justice Network. Uh, so we have confirmed speakers are uh, Adrian Hollis with Union Concerned Scientists. Uh, we have Bernice Miller Travis, uh, you know, with the Executive Vice President with the Metropolitan Group, uh, Peggy Shepard, and also a co founder of We Act for Environmental Justice. Uh, Peggy Shepard, a uh, co-founder and executive director of We Act for Environmental Justice, and, and Peyton Wilkins, executive director of the Coalition of Black Trade Unionist um, Education Center. So what I want to do first is just give you a little bit more uh, on our speakers. And I'm going to our, the bios page that I have to find again. So uh, first I'll have uh, Peggy Shepard is co-founder executive director of a nonprofit We Act for Environmental Justice in New York, New York in Harlem, New York. She's been involved in uh, with organizing environmental protection campaigns since the 1980s. Uh, she's, she's done a, a lot of great work in the area of environmental justice, but also climate justice. And she'll be able to talk about more of her, her extensive experience uh, as an EJ icon uh, in, this, in this discussion. Uh, Peyton Wilkins has been infectiously referred to as an environmental justice baby. Uh, growing up in one of America's most uh, segregated municipalities, uh, he's developed a, a great relationship, really understanding issues between justice, race, and place. Uh, he does a, 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 a lot of work on these issues, and he's a founding member of the HPCU uh, Climate Change Consortium, which is probably one of, the, one of the best models of how academic institutions, in this case HBCUs, are, in, are engaged with communities, frontline and fence line communities on, on environmental justice issues. Uh, we also have uh, Vernice Miller Travis, who has also been a leader in the EJ movement, one of those icons in the EJ movement that I look up to for the past 30 years. Uh, she helped with Charles Lee with the UCC, uh, helped to write the first one, the first reports on, uh, on uh, environmental injustice, toxic waste and race, 1987. Uh, she was part of that group that got President Clinton to sign, to sign Executive Order 12898. And, and she's been doing a lot of work of, as a program officer with Ford Foundation uh, to her work uh, now, really looking at issues of environmental justice when it comes to planning, zoning, uh, community engagement. And, and just want to, just really excited to have her on this panel. And then again, uh, we have a Dr. Adrian Hollis who I keep forgetting to mention is not just a doctor, she also is a lawyer. And so I'm sorry about that. Senior climate justice and health scientist at the Union Concerned Scientists and doing a lot of work, as I said earlier in the first panel, uh, looking at uh, determinants of health impacts of climate change uh, on communities of color and, and really doing work that really prioritizes how we need to address climate injustice in environmental assaults through policy approaches to more effectively improve the health in lives of frontline and fence line uh, EJ communities. So what I wanna do now is get into the questions uh, for this esteemed panel. And so the first question is, you know, what is the National Black Environmental Justice Network? It, it was just recently re relaunched. What is this network? Why do we need this network? And uh, I'm gonna start with uh, Vernice first. Why do we, wh what are your thoughts about why we need this network? Go ahead, Vernice. So I'm going to start with why we needed the network to begin with in 1999, and, and hopefully Peggy can, um, can take it to why we thought it was important to bring it back. And in 1999, we had a dear colleague, a friend, brother um, in the movement for every justice movement. His name was Damu Smith, and he lived in the District of Columbia. 
Um, and he, at the time, he worked for the Greenpeace as the Southeast Regional Director. So he was based between Atlanta and DC, and he did a tremendous amount of organizing in um, the Cancer, uh, Cancer Alley Corridor in New Orleans, uh, in Louisiana, between Baton Rouge and, and um, New Orleans. And when you work on the ground in Cancer Alley, you get to see up close and personal what are the day-to-day -day experiences of what it's like to be African-American, to live in a place that's surrounded by sources of pollution and contamination, that you have no agency over making the decisions about how those, those facilities come to be in close proximity to where you are, and or you are not valued and listened to in a decision-making and planning process um, to cease that. And he saw so much of that. Um, doing organizing with Greenpeace and all the communities in the can in Cancer Rally, including the Deep South Center for Environmental Justice, which at the time was at Xavier University in New Orleans. Um, and he said to all of us, uh, because we, we began to notice, Peggy and I certainly noticed it, we had our own unique challenges in New York City and Harlem where we lived. Um, uh, Peyton's mother, Donnell Wilkins, saw those challenges in Detroit, um, which caused her to start uh, one of the, the earliest EJ organizations in the country um, in Detroit. We saw it all over the country. And so Damo said, we, we had been organizing around this. Peggy and I had been organ organizing around these issues since the mid 80s. Um, uh, Damu uh, also organizing since the 80s. Um, all of us came together, the first National People of Color Environmental Leadership Summit in, that was held in Washington, D.C. in 1990, 1991 at the Washington Court Hotel, where we wrote and produced the principles of environmental justice and set off on a strategy to build capacity in our organizations. But one of the odd things that happened at the first National People of Color Summit, and, and I'm sure Peggy will remember this, is that we, we spread out at a certain point and told everybody to go and organize by constituency. And so the Native Americans were organizing, the Asian and Pacific Islanders were off in a space organizing, the Latinos were organizing, people were organizing by region, but the black folks were standing around. We were not asked to organize. Everybody else split off to talk about, well, what does this look like specifically in our communities? Everybody but the black people. Though we were the majority of the people there, we were the majority of the people who raised the money, we were the majority of the people who were doing work on the ground, but we were not organized. And this went on for a number of years. And finally, because the assaults on our community were so vicious and so never ending and relentless and the disproportionate rates of death and disease were so high and traumatic in our communities, Damu put out a statement um, and said, we are in a crisis, in a state of emergency. And every black person who cares about this issue needs to come to New Orleans and stand together and meet and figure out what we're going to do about it. And so we had this meeting in December of 1999 in New Orleans that Damu um, called. And I don't know if Peggy remembers the original name of the organization, but we had so many acronyms in that original name that our dear friend Dion Ferris used to call us the ABCDEFG organization because there were so many names. We, you know, we, we, we just couldn't call it the Emergency Coalition for black people in distress, blah, 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 blah. It went on and on and on and on. And eventually we settled on the National Black Environmental Justice Network. But I want to say that when we established the National Black Environmental Justice Network in 1999, you would think that our brothers and sisters across the field of environmental justice would um, come to our aid and would say, we really support and applaud our brothers and sisters who are African descended um, for coming to stand up and defend their people in their crisis. But that is not what happened. In fact, we were attacked left, right, and center by all our brothers and sisters that we have been building the environmental justice movement with because Black people decided to come together and organize on behalf of Black people. We were unapologetic about it then. We are unapologetic about it now. Um, and I will just say one last thing before I turn it over to Peggy. Um, uh, you mentioned that we uh, this um, closing plenary today is about the syndemic um, of racism and slavery and um, police brutality and environmental assaults and public health and disease that we have lived with for millennia in this country. 
Um, and syndemic yes is a word that Vernice did not coin, but Vernice pulled it out of the ether to say that this is exactly what we have been dealing with. And I want to just take it back to the original conversations in the environmental justice movement and the National Black Environmental Justice Network, because we talked about multiple and synergistic exposures. We've been asking and pounding on NIH, on NIEHS, on CDC, on EPA, on everybody. Tell us what happens physiologically, biochemically to people when you live in a place that has multiple sources of pollution and contamination that you breathe, that you inhale, that you drink in your water, that you eat in your food, that's found in the places where you live and the places where you play and the places where you recreate. What does that do to the body? when you are assaulted on a daily basis, 24 seven, 365. To this day, nobody has been able to answer our question. We've asked for it in policy. We've asked for it um, in terms of articulation of what the values of CDC research and NIH funded research is. We've asked for it for 25 years and nobody has been able to answer the question. But what we were talking about then is what is a syndemic? What happens when racism relentless, unrelenting racism, environmental exposure, health disparities converge to control and inform your life on a daily basis. That is what a syndemic is. We didn't know that word syndemic, but we coined the experience. We may not have coined the term, but we certainly coined the live experience. And I want to turn it over to Peggy. Yeah, go ahead, Peggy. Oh my God, I don't know if there's anything left to say. <laughs> well, talk about now, Peggy. Why are we doing it now? Yeah, why now? You know, why now? Because we really understand that there's an arc of racism. It's permeated every sector of our society, whether it's healthcare, criminal justice, which, you know, we're seeing all of the, the protests around those issues, environmental justice, food security, housing segregation, just every sector. And, you know, it's really a system of power and informal and reformal structures that really hits all of our institutions, whether it's government, nonprofits, philanthropy, and it assigns, it assigns certain values to certain groups and communities, and it assigns the least value to black communities. I think when we realized the impact of COVID on our communities, that black people were dying at, at higher rates, two to three times the rate of that they exist in the population. And it really raised the issue of environmental justice because we began to understand uh, from the Harvard studies that if you lived in more polluted, air polluted communities, that you were at higher risk uh, of death from COVID. And so that began to help explain uh, some of the, uh, the death rates we were seeing. And so we understood that black people were at higher risk uh, and that environmental justice, again, was a, a key issue. And that, of course, our zip code makes a big difference where we live because of housing segregation and a whole host of other uh, racism uh, dynamics. And so we realized that this was the time to you know, reawaken, to revitalize the network, and to bring our you know, our HBCUs together to bring our black organizations together so that we can really begin to uh, address this uh, triple pandemic of racism, COVID and, cl and the climate crisis. Thank you. So Kobe, uh, I just wanna add that, I forgot uh, to add that our brother Damu Smith who founded the National Black Environmental Justice Network died um, in 2005 from um, uh, end-stage colon cancer when he was originally diagnosed uh, while on a trip to Palestine and Israel. Um, he was medevac back home to a Sibley Hospital and his original diagnosis was end-stage colon cancer. Um, and I, so we, we were hit so hard emotionally by his death that the network um, just petered out. And so here we are um, re-establishing re the network in his name, Dana Alston's name, um, and so many other um, wonderful and extraordinary African-American environmental justice leaders who we have lost tragically um, before their time. Hazel Johnson, um, so, so, so many people, but um, most especially Damu, who was the person who came up with this idea, the National Black Environmental Justice Network. Well, thank you for that. 
uh, uh, Dr. Hollis? Yeah, um, um, I think I'm just going to piggyback on what uh, Peggy said. You know, given um, my work and the work of others in the in the field, um, where we look at how um, we have all these synergistic effects from not only environmental exposure, well, racism, environmental exposure, um, of course, climate change, and how it all affects public health. Um, most recently, of course, with COVID-19. And for me, one of the things that underlined the importance of the network was the fact that I feel like once um, people started realizing that this was, um, that COVID-19 sort of affected communities of color, first and worst, um, the interest appeared to peter out, or the focus was no longer on, let's address this issue right now. And I felt even the media had, um, turned their attention away from the concerns, the pandemic that we were struggling with, and that, you know, there was no better time, you know, in the words of uh, Hilton, there is no better time for us to work together. And, you know, I totally agree with that because um, I like, I've always liked the phrase for us, by us. And I think when you're not that sort of satisfaction or, or understanding or recognition even from those who are tasked with protecting um, the public, then that's when you have to step up because as Renisa always says, there is the cavalry ain't coming. So you have to um, protect yourselves. And so for me, that's one of the main reasons um, why this, um, the network is so uh, timely, you know, so timely to, for it to be reconstituted at this time. Thank you, thank you. Peyton, any thoughts? Um, not really sure what I can add. I, I think um, everyone has pretty much captured uh, uh, why we relaunched MBJN, what it's needed for. Um, I, all I can simply do is echo that a lot of the same voids that led to um, the creation of this network still exist. And, um, I think this is a great opportunity uh, uh, for us to continue the work that, that, that paused in um, 05 after uh, Bob Damu passed. Can, okay. can I ask Peyton a question? Yeah, go ahead. So, Peyton, what generation are you? X, Y, Z, what the hell do y'all, they call y'all? I think I'm millennial. I'm 89, so I'm, I'm right on the, the crest. <laughs> so, why, why, why is it important for you and your generation to be in this space? Um, you know, it, it's, I, I think the environmental justice movement uh, provides a, a great deal of insight into the matrix in which our injustices evolved. Um, and, and without that sort of theoretical framework to understand our state of, uh, of, of, of oppression right now, um, I, I believe it, it leads us, um, or it, it has the potential to lead us um, uh, uh, astray from the direction that we need to be moving. Um, so I, I think that, it, it, that um, this, this network and, and environmental justice movement in general is uh, 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 so essential to the conversations that we're having today um, as we unpack what is oppression, what is injustice, and, and how does that um, have a relationship within our environments, right, and, and, and my zip code. So thank you for that. I was going to, um, I see some uh, comments and questions coming in from the audience. So I'm going to go to this next question. I'm going to come back to that audience question, Dr. Holloman, question in a little bit. So, so question for, I'm going to go to Dr. Hollis first. So how's a network providing support to communities in, in need? So I'm talking about this endemic. So we're talking about the toxic racism part of this endemic. How's the network providing support to communities uh, in need during this time with regards to toxic racism? How, how are you addressing this personally in your own work? Well, in my own work, um, one of the ways is um, through education. And um, I like to use my, um, not only social media, but more, more specifically my blogs, my blog posts to uh, shine a light on issues. For example, give you a great example, the issue around um, um, our most at risk populations and their healthcare coverage. Uh, and I'm speaking specifically in terms of telemedicine. And, and, and I can relate this to my mom who's at, who mm -hmm you know, is immunocompromised, a four-time cancer survivor, and her doctors kept insisting that she come in. Uh, but she was only coming in, they wanted to just talk to her. And she would call me and then I would call them and say, why is she coming in? Why can't you do telemedicine? And they were like, oh, we need to check her insurance. By this time, of course, most insurance companies were uh, uh, approved telemedicine, right? Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. think that we know this. And they said, oh, yes, she qualifies. And I said, well, why didn't you tell her that? Their answer to me was she didn't ask. And this is the same sort of situation that most of the um, 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 people find themselves in, particularly people who are a little older. She's a little more older than me, but don't tell her that. But people who are a little older, you know, who, of course, the first, one of the first groups of people that they trust are their physicians and medical care professionals. But you're making somebody come in in an area which Mobile happens to be a hot, air, uh, you know, a hot spot for COVID-19, mm-hmm. and making somebody come in unnecessarily. And then when um, toward the end, uh, these last few months, you know, a lot of medical insurance companies have lifted the right to telemedicine, but they haven't told their um, insureds. So when you make your appointment and you say, oh, I want to do telemedicine, that's when you find out that you're no longer covered for that and that you have to come in because, of course, it costs more for, you know, you're charged more for coming in than you are for doing telemedicine. So I think one of the things that um, NBEJ, uh, excuse me, NBEJN does is provide education. And one of the things that I do is also um, education at, as in, hey, did y'all know this? You know, because, I mean, people want to know three things, right? What is it? How does it affect me? And what can I do about it? Mm-hmm. And that has always been the focus of you know, my activities, what, what, what we try to do. And I think that's one of the focuses of the network too, is to provide uh, people with the support system that they need in order to address the issues that they're fighting in their particular communities. And also to shed light on those issues so that groups of people can get together in partnership to address them together. No, thank you for that. That's Peyton. Can you try that question, please? Um, sure. So, uh, you, you know, I, I see NBEJM providing a, a, a lot of support um, uh, in, in a few different ways. Um, uh, the, the, the major one, I think, is providing education um, and, and training, right? And, and that's something that um, I do at CBTU. Um, we focus on lately um, PPE in the context of COVID-19. Uh, we, uh, uh, um, so, you know, I, I see MBEJN as an extension of those types of uh, uh, programming and, and, and ideas, right? And MBEJN is also focused on making sure that uh, we raise uh, uh, funds as a cohort to address these issues that we face both locally and nationally. Okay, cool. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So let, let's go to uh, Peggy next. On the toxic racism, how is the network ad- helping address that? And how are you doing it in your, in your own work? Sure. You know, when we left the, uh, the first summit, the mandate was to go home and build a strong base. So mm-hmm. MBEJN is working to build a base of support among a variety of diverse Black-led organizations so that we can coalesce together, provide the kind of education and technical assistance that our communities need. Um, In Harlem with We Act for Environmental Justice, um, we took that mandate very seriously. Our theory of change is about organizing community residents most affected to engage in environmental decision making. And we are doing that through uh, ensuring that we are identifying with our community members the issues and concerns and challenges that they're experiencing and we are then working with them in campaigns, some of which they are leading uh, to develop the kinds of policies at the city, state and federal level uh, that are needed to uh, really have a sustainable and healthy community. Uh, In New York City right now, we've developed two environmental justice um, laws, one that creates a permanent uh, EJ task force and another that um, really, works to implement a citywide environmental justice study of EJ communities, what those challenges are, and is developing, uh, working with agencies to develop um, responses to to those challenges. So again, we're ensuring that our community residents are involved in these uh, task forces, involved in identifying their challenges, And, you know, another thing we've had to do during COVID, because that has really impacted the way that we can do community organizing, we've really had to reach out to our membership, which is about a thousand members now. And we've had to uh, really understand and survey them on how many of you have a smartphone, how many of you can access the internet, uh, can, and then if you can uh, access the internet, 
have you ever used a Zoom platform? And so also being able to train them and give them information on how to use these platforms so that we can really communicate and stay in touch. Um, because the city really has not um, been very effective in, um, in outreach to our communities. Um, once we realized, of course, that, you know, climate change, you know, was going to create more extreme weather uh, and extreme heat every year. Um, and of course, now we're staying at home. Uh, we were staying at home during the summer. We have a cold snap now, it seems, but um, usually it's still very hot now. And so we got the city to um, give out something like 79,000 air conditioners. And they couldn't even give away free air conditioners because they had some sort of system of, you know, they do robocalls. I mean, how many people, you know, have a landline now, right? Um, so they're doing robocalls to landlines. And then you had to pick up the phone and make some other phone calls in order to get these air conditioners. So at the end, they had to reach out to groups like ours to help make the contacts um, to get these air conditioners out. So, you know, that's just one of the elements of how the city really has not been able to reach our particular communities. And they only began to do that when they saw the COVID numbers. They said, oh my God, we've got to put, you know, millions of dollars into an investment in education and, you know, working with folks in the Bronx or Harlem or whatever, you know, those communities um, that were experiencing the pandemic the most. And you really began very late to, to put the, um, the investment there. And of course, one of the reasons MBAJN exists is, is because of the disinvestment in our communities. And so we are, which we'll talk about later, um, doing a number of things to, um, to make sure that investment is coming. To our yeah, no, thank you for that. And thanks. We're going to, we're going to get to the, the investments and ec the economic questions in, in the next question. And this will give the mic to uh, Bernice on this question. Uh, how do you think the, the network can, you know, uh, how it, is it addressing toxic racism? And you know, I mean, you may, you don't have to repeat what other folks have said and how you're doing this in your own work addressing toxic racism. Well, one, I've been doing, I guess, because I've been home for so much, I've actually had a chance to write. Um, and publish a number of articles um, and, and blogs and um, online pieces just to, to continue to keep the attention focused on the disproportionate impact of COVID on African-American communities and other communities of color. But um, I, you know, one thing that, that I certainly take from MBE, EJN initially and now in our relaunch is that um, we spend so much time in the EJ movement building a social movement um, as we did for the civil rights movement. Um, and um, we build a platform and we build a social movement and we fight and fight and fight to make social change for everybody. Um, and oftentimes black folks get left, left out of the things that we have built, right? And here's just one example. And, I, and, and I'm very happy about this development that I'm about to talk about. Earlier this summer, the Supreme Court, and let's just say God rest, um, uh, Justice Ginsburg's soul. Um, I'm going to try not to talk about that because it'll make me so very emotional about the loss of her. But earlier in the summer, while she was fighting um, uh, cancer, pancreatic cancer, the Supreme Court um, uh, rendered a decision uh, in a case that makes it illegal to bar um, LBTQI folk from employment just because of who they are, which was the law of the land. In many states, you could just fire people because they were gay. Um, and the Supreme Court said that was unconstitutional and a violation of what? The Civil Rights Act of 1964, right? So many people have benefited from the work that we did that we put our lives on the line for, that we paid with our blood, sweat, and tears. And we're happy about that. We really are, that we gave a new frame for people to see our collective humanity. But mm -hmm. Black folks often get pushed to the side as these new conversations come forward. And so in the EJ movement, it has been no different. Um, and I, I just want to say at this moment, when we are once again on the bubble in terms of our lives and, and our longevity, our mortality, our health, our viability, 
um, is particularly being undermined by COVID-19. And somebody asked in the chat, why is that? So I just want to speak on why that is. Um, the Harvard School of Public Health researchers in Italy, researchers in Wuhan, China, have told us that one of the ways that COVID is moving, and the reason that it's moving through the world and is so pervasive, is because it's moving and attaching itself to air pollution particularly fine particle pollution. And I just saw an article yesterday, maybe nitrogen dioxide as well, but it's certainly <laughs> attaching itself to fine particles. That's like black carbon, black soot, that thing if you live near a transportation cart and you see all that black soot in your windowsill and you're constantly wiping it up, you can inhale that. And that triggers all kinds of, um, all kinds of respiratory impacts, but that's how COVID is moving. It's moving through the air. It's the one truthful thing Don Donald Trump actually said. It is literally moving through the air, but the air where we, believe, where we live is particularly polluted. It has really high rates of particulate pollution and other air pollutants. And so that's why I believe that's why our communities are on the bubble. As soon as we found out that information, and it took a mighty, mighty, mighty fight with the Centers for Disease Control to get them to release that disaggregated data to tell us how are people experiencing this pandemic race group by race group, ethnicity by ethnicity. It was a hell of a fight to get that data out of the CDC. And even now, we're still only getting a portion of that data, not the totality of what's happening with COVID cases across the country. But what we know is that Black folks are catching hell. Mm -hmm. Black folks have higher incidence of COVID and higher rates of death from COVID. Now, Adrian has been tracking a different thing, and she scares the hell out of me every day with this information. So Adrian is like the data guru, right? And Adrian is watching this data in a way that nobody else is watching this data. So every day, every day, Adrian checks the website um, for our, our, our Maryland um, Department of Health and Mental Hygiene to see what the information is about our state, about our county, um, and about the city that we live in. So Adrian, Dr. Wilson and I all live in the same town. Um, and she was the person who first alerted me to, there's something really amiss going on in our county, right? So in the United States of America, only 22% of all counties in the United States of America have majority African-American populations. We in Prince George's County, Maryland are one of those 22% of counties. But 57% of death from COVID is coming from those 22% of counties. What the hell, mm -hmm. right? Something is really amiss. And we had an earlier conversation about whether we're wealthy, whether we're not wealthy. Yes, damn it, we're wealthy, okay? On the, on the continuum of wealth and, and accumulation of financial resources, the people in Prince George's County, not all of us, but a lot of us are way on the income scale. So the question comes back to something that Peggy and I did more than 30 years ago, something that I, I was privileged to do with the United Church of Christ 33 years ago, which is to separate race from income, from level of educational attainment, from all other social indicators. Race is the most statistically significant indicator in this COVID reality and in so many other environmental realities. And so if we know that, and we've known that for more than 30 years, why are we still in the circumstances that we are? And what's particularly unique about Prince George's County is we are a county with affluence you know, relative, right? Relative to all other African-American people in the United States of America. Yeah. Not relative to white folks in Montgomery County, not relative to white folks in Anne Arundel County, the county that's next door to us, not talking about them, just talking about the pool of African-American people. If we are the most affluent African-American community in the United States, and we are, and I'm not going to argue that point with folks, we are, why? Do we have the highest rate and incidence of COVID in the state of Maryland and the highest rate of death from COVID in the state of Maryland? What is that about? And if it's not about race, then what is it about? And that's why MBEJN is needed because we need to tease out that data. We need to drive a different narrative. We need to keep the focus and attention on what is happening to us and our lives. Our black lives matter. And we've been saying this for a long time, we can't breathe. I'm sorry to, you know, I'm sorry to, to make people get confused about it, but we said that 30 years ago and we can't breathe and we're still dying. And the question is why and what are we going to do about it? Thank you, Vernice. Um, that relative is important, though. We'll talk more about that wealth thing later at, at another time. 
because uh, because you look at the Robert Wood Johnson health indicators data for the for the for the state. Yeah, we the wealthiest compared to those other counties, but we look at our state, we in the we're in the we're in the middle in a lot of health rankings, and that's that's confusing. That's a that's confusing. So I'm gonna I'm gonna come swing back around to um, Peggy, and she was gonna talk about this unequal economic opportunity. So Peggy, so how uh, Reverend Lawson when he eulogized um, Rep, uh, Representative Lewis, he used the term plantation capitalism. How 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 is the network fighting against um, this toxic economy and plantation capitalism in this country and fighting for equitable economic development? How how's the network doing it, and how are you doing it in your own work? So I, I would ask all of you all to go to the EBEJN website. Um, they've put up data and papers around economic justice and frontline worker statements. Uh, they've aggregated data. Um, they're really exposing what's going on. How many of you all know that 90% of black owned businesses were frozen out of the relief loans passed by Congress? So again, we, we're exposing that kind of information. We're also, you know, again, going back at looking at the home ownership rates. Um, we're looking at the fact that Black Americans faced serious complications because they were the frontline workers. And we're looking at how many frontline workers um, have, you know, gotten COVID. And now we're seeing that many frontline workers in terms of small businesses have been laid off. So again, um, we are undergoing uh, an incredible economic uh, disparity here. Uh, when we look at the amount of people unemployed. Um, and so MBEJN has been developing that data and is exposing it. And please go to the website and take a look. Um, what we have been doing in, in Harlem is we have trained over 800 residents uh, in a free worker training program uh, around a variety of construction uh, activities. We've also trained over 100 community residents, mostly young men, some young women, uh, in solar installation. And so we have begun to, to work to keep housing affordable, which again is an economic impact, uh, by working uh, to put solar installations on the roofs of tenant-owned cooperatives uh, in Harlem. Again, you know, people talk about gentrification and how do we keep our communities affordable? Utility bills are one of those um, you know, highest bills that we face. Uh, the energy and justice and energy and security in this community is absolutely incredible. So how do, how do we begin to fight gentrification by keeping housing affordable and that the energy costs are really important? We also know that the transition away from fossil fuels to a sustainable energy economy will create hundreds of thousands of new jobs. And so we have also, uh, when we realize that, you know, again, our labor unions um, have a lot of bias. And so they are not really providing the pipeline for the folks that we've trained. You know, you can train thousands of workers, but if there's no job pipeline for them, um, it's, it's all for naught. So we have worked with some of the folks we've trained in solar installation to develop their own solar worker cooperative. And so they have now incorporated, uh, they are bidding on jobs. Uh, we Act is incubating them uh, and we are helping them um, in terms of staff support. And so they are now be being able to bid on jobs and, and they're now working to, uh, to get an MBE certification. So uh, we're calling our program Sun Solar Uptown Now. And um, when, I, when I see this cooperative uh, program, um, it, this cooperative business, they're able to get jobs up and down, uh, up to upstate New York, downstate New York. And you know it's really great that we've been able to get them trained through another environmental justice organization called uh, the Workers Cooperative, which is run by, um, you know, a longtime environmental justice activist who used to run the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance. So again, 
of working together, we've, we understand that we're going to have to create our own entities and our own companies uh, to provide the kind of support for the workers that we need. Uh, I'd also say that another way MBEJN is, um, you know, is really fostering its influence. Uh, Beverly, Dr. Beverly Wright, um, who is, um, you know, a, a co-founder of the renewed uh, MBEJN, is co-chairing or co-leading the uh, Climate Resilience uh, Committee uh, for Biden. Uh, I am co-leading the Environmental Justice Subcommittee. So again, uh, these are ways that we're working to ensure that we're part of environmental decision making and ensuring that, um, you know, that our, our facts, that our dynamics, our challenges, our concerns, our recommendations are being uh, advanced through a variety of, um, through a variety of opportunities. No, thank you. I, I just want to commend you on the work that, um, that, that you are doing, and I appreciate your saying the, the committee work that you and, and Dr. Wright are doing. I just want to highlight, you're talking about eco-entrepreneurship, you're talking about solutions to energy poverty, you're talking about energy equity, energy justice. You, you're talking about, you know, creating, co building uh, new community ecosystems, right? and looking at climate changes and looking at it from a climate opportunity perspective. So I just want to highlight the solutions focus that, that you just covered in your comments. Let's go to uh, Peyton next. On the economic side, Peyton, the, you know, thoughts about the network is doing it and, and what you're doing in your own work. Um, well, uh, uh, like uh, uh, Miss, Mrs. Peggy Shepard mentioned, um, and I'm going to just encourage folks again, visit MBEJN's website to um, look at the statements that have been written um, in particular on this subject. Um, and uh, one of the only things I, I can really add to uh, Mr. Shepard's statement is uh, the, uh, the networks um, uh, 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 calling and, and, and demand that a racial equity lens be applied to follow um, how this money moves, right? Um, Harold Laswell in 1950 wrote, um, who gets what, when, where, and how. And, and, and we've been able to see how capitalism um, influences uh, disaster relief um, in, in, in recent history and today and uh, a few weeks ago, right? And um, like, again, Mrs. Shepard had mentioned, uh, you know, 95% of Black-owned businesses were locked out of the SBA uh, relief loans, right? 91% Latino, uh, Latinx, excuse me, were locked out. 91% Native American, um, First Nation, 75% uh, uh, um, Asian-owned businesses. Um, so uh, this demand that MBEJN um, is, is making is, is, is clear that it's needed, right? Um, and as far as what CBTU is doing, um, like she mentioned, uh, uh, labor unions have their own bias. So CBTU, in a lot of ways, uh, we've had to resort to creating informal networks of pipelines into um, trade uh, uh, um, apprenticeship and previous apprenticeship programs. Um, but, you know, uh, with that being said, I don't want to uh, take away from the trainings that we do, um, like um, hazardous waste um, and, and um, exposure, which a lot of individuals have been able to use to get jobs in, in, in fields related to chemical exposure. Um, and, and, you know, beyond that, uh, CBTU is made up of 55 chapters across 25 states and three countries. Um, we have a chapter in Oakland, uh, California, that uh, uh, partners very closely with the Cypress Mandela Center and uh, have created a pipeline for um, African Americans and and um, uh, 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 tons of people to go through and come out and get um, you know union and labor jobs and uh, you know I, I would be doing a disservice if I didn't mention the um, initiatives taken by the construction uh, uh, industry to ensure that individuals re-entering society receive um, training and jobs right like there's been a lot of uh, um, steps um, um, towards making sure that uh, those individuals have a, 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 a job getting out of, of prison, right? Um, so, uh, and, and, you know, beyond that, we want to make sure that we continue to contribute to the body of, of research being created and accumulated by our network, um, uh, uh, exploring um, this, this question of economics and this relationship within our environment. 
Well, thank you. Uh, Vernice? I'm sorry, the question? Oh, uh, this is about how is the network, you know, you know, others have already said, but how's the network uh, combating this toxic economy, plantation capitalism? And maybe you just want to talk more about how your organization is, and your work uh, focuses on uh, eradicating plantation capitalism and really focusing more on equitable economic development opportunity structures. So in terms of my own work um, and how that's related to what MBEJN is doing is, you know, really trying to shift the narrative um, and shift people's understanding about what we mean when we say these terms, um, who is in, as, um, as Peyton said, who is in and who is outside the framework of, um, you know, receiving the resources or even being acknowledged that they need those resources. Um, you know, one thing, uh, Dr. Robert Bullard, who is um, one of the, the, um, the main energizers of restarting MBEJN says all the time is that we have to build our own networks, our own infrastructure, our own source of income, and stop being dependent on other things and other people. Um, you know, I used to work for the Ford Foundation, and um, I and Peggy may remember that I thought that we were going to be able to change the world with the four million dollars that I was giving away a year. We couldn't. We could barely make a dent in New York City with four million dollars, but. There is capital within our community. A lot of people are laid off now and a lot of people are struggling financially, but there's still capital in our communities that go elsewhere and that flow outside of the community. How do we make sure that we have different channels that reinvest in our own infrastructure um, and that build up our own businesses and that lift up our own scholars and our own research, um, our own media uh, empires? People may remember, at least people who live down here in the DMV, um, uh, BET, was housed in and started and is still headquartered in Washington, D.C. Um, you know, and, and it changed the world about how people see us, right? Um, and don't get me started on the videos, but in, in a profound way, it changed the world, about, it, the world's vision about how they see black folk. And I think we have to grab a hold, and this is work that I do every, every day, um, of, of writing a narrative about our reality that's based in data and science about what's happening to folks, but, but it's not a narrative about, as was talked about in an earlier panel, not a narrative about demerits, but a narrative about assets, a narrative about power building, a narrative about our history and our culture, what we have given to this country, what we continue to give to this country, how we have shaped so much of what we've done, every institution has been influenced by the work of Black folk, sometimes acknowledged and sometimes not. And we need to tell our own story, tell our own narrative, uh, lift it up, have new voices in telling that narrative, use social media to do that, use people in popular culture to do that. Look at what the NBA, N NBA folks are doing and the WNBA folks are doing, right? Um, they're risking their own financial well-being, probably breaking lots of contracts to get out there and talk about Black Lives Matter, right? And to go on a, a, a two-day strike, um, folks are, are stepping into this, and, and as black folk, as people of color, as progressive people, we have to change, we have to tell a new story and build new institutions and lift each other up in the process of doing that. And we got to let go of the crabs in the barrel mentality, right? If you get ahead, then that means I'm not getting ahead. That really, really keeps black folk from making a lot of progress, and we have got to let that go. We're in the 21st century, and we're in the fight of our lives. We ain't got time for that. Thank you, Vernice. I wanted to go back to a comment you made and go back to something that Peggy said. Co-op model, right? Building your own stuff. You, you, you know, Jackie uh, Patterson also is on, on the steering committee, uh, helped relaunch the network, wrote a, wrote a blog for the network, and she talked about, you know, a, a right to water, a right to food, a right to clean air, a right to energy, and, and building your own, this, you know, community, you like these eco, I'm going to call it ecotopias. I got another word I use, but I just call it ecotopia for right now. So ecotopia is right. So that's what y'all are basically saying. So how can we, you know, get back to that kind of building that built, having that technical infrastructure, technical uh, 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 sort of resources in the community and building it and maintaining it and making it, helping it grow. And that to me is a really important uh, theme that y'all cover. Dr. Hollis, could you go ahead and, and on this question? Are you muted? Yeah, um, so um, I'm not sure your point. I was so enthralled by what you were saying that I lost the question and all that. Oh, oh sorry. This, this is the question about how the network, in your opinion, you know, has been looking at this whole issue of economic development and 
you know, toxic capitalism and, 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 and toxic economies and you know, your own work. How are you doing that? And how are you on the positive side, as Renice just said, how are you building uh, new economic opportunity structures? How should we be doing that? Well, Justice that's, a, that's a good question. And, and um, I think um, uh, one of the things is to have, you have to change people's mindset. That's the same thing Mustafa was saying earlier. Um, at the Union of Concerned Scientists, one of the things that a number of us are pushing for is these strong partnerships with community organizations as equal partners, as stakeholders in this issue, recognizing that and, rec and in that recognizing the importance of community science, right? That it's not secondary to uh, laboratory science, laboratory-based science or applied science, but that in, in a lot of instances, it's even more important and more impactful and making sure that communities are, um, have the opportunity to be heard, to tell their story, as uh, Bernice said. Uh, a perfect example, um, after Hurricane Laura, uh, you know, I was, we were in communication with uh, Hilton Kelly like all the time to the point where I was like, well, let me let you drive because I was just always on the phone. Are you okay? Because they hadn't planned on evacuation. That was after they were told that this was a non-survivable storm that was going to hit. And thank God it wasn't as bad as um, initially thought. But, you know, um, the issue was what can we do to assist you? Not like give a helping hand, but what is it that you identify as an issue, as areas that, you know, you need immediate assistance in, right? And then another thing we, you know, um, and Omega and Brenda Wilson have a, a great model where they have a MOU, and you know this, uh, Shigobi, the MOU agreement and how, it's, uh, how it outlines the roles and responsibilities of various partners. And um, I know it's been sort of slow to gain um, popularity or I think people probably don't understand it, but part of it is, um, um, giving people the, what I was going to say about Hilton, first of all, I got so excited, was that he, every time somebody called a reporter, I would encourage, you know, send them to him, send them to somebody who's on the ground, who's, work, who's living this, right? Because communities do speak for themselves, so let them. And he said within a short time period, he had about seven or eight phone calls from the media, right? Where he could tell them what was going on and what was needed and those like, and things like that. So giving people their voice, well, they already have their voice, but giving them that opportunity that they deserve, it's, it's, it's not even an opportunity, it's a right. Just like Jackie was saying, the right to water, right? It's not even an opportunity, like we're gonna do this for you. It's, it's recognizing that you haven't had what you were entitled to and making sure that you get it. And I think that um, through the, um, my vision for the um, network is that it empowers people. Right in a variety of ways, and part of that is is um, pointing out and educating them on what's lacking, and then how can we address what's lacking, and what can you do at the state, local, and federal level to make that you know to make that change, and how you know like even now we encourage people to reach out to your legislators while they're at home or or you know because they're not going anywhere, or even when they're you know um, on on recess, call them, have a face, have a virtual meeting with them, and and talk about your issues because you elected them. You're exactly. possible to you. And I think that people don't, don't remember that, but they answer to us. You know, we don't work for them. It goes the other way around. And part of that is, is giving people that, you know, saying to them, you know, you have the right to be pissed, to be upset, to be outspoken, and to demand, you know, to, to demand your rights. And so I, I think in a way it empowers people. And then no. that's the thing we're trying to do at UCS. No, that, that's a powerful statement. That, I mean, that's civics one-on-one. Mm -hmm. Early in the earlier session, you vote them in, you hold them accountable. I mean, you hired me, Adrian, to do a job. You ain't going to wait four years to evaluate me. Right. <laughs> Y'all? Well, I, I will tell you this, and, and, and uh, Peggy can tell you more. Um, we at grew out of a, an effort in northern Manhattan and Harlem to build an independent political voice within the Democratic Party because our own Black elected officials were not representing us and were not protecting us from the environmental threats and harm. So we started by mobilizing people to vote, get involved in the political process, um, vote for people who support you and vote out people who do not. And so that's always been, been core to, to, to our mission at, at WEAC. But I, I just want to say one vignette about, um, share one vignette about this conversation. Um, 
when Black Panther came out, um, it came out the weekend of my birthday and Dr. Hollis surprised me with, with tickets the second day it was open to go and see it for my birthday. And um, as the credits were rolling up, and I, I am not a person that likes that genre per se, the Marvel movies and superheroes mm -hmm. and all of that. Um, and as the credits were rolling at the end and the lights came up, Dr. Hollis turned to me and she said, why are you crying? And I said, I have no idea. I didn't know that I was crying. I had no idea why I was crying. And then I think it was that same weekend, Joy Reid on MSNBC published a piece online on MSNBC. And she talked about that while some of it was futuristic, this actually could have happened in Africa if we hadn't, uh, Europe hadn't spent so much time underdeveloping Africa, right? Um, and there's a famous book, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. But all the resources, all the minerals, everything that we use now in technology is still coming out of the continent, but the continent is not um, benefiting from that in any way. There's some uh, really interesting, I think there's some multimillionaire who's trying to do some technology investment in Botswana. I read about yesterday, but what struck me about that movie is that, you know, if, if we had not uh, rape, pillaged and plundered Africa and we had stayed there, all this creativity that we have here, had been programmed there to build the economy there and societies there, some of what we saw, you know, Wakanda would have been a realizable thing in a lot of different places. And though I couldn't articulate it at the time, that's why I was crying at the end of the movie because it was, it was possible, it was within our grasp. And so we're here now, we've been here for 401 years. So why not try to build that infrastructure and that economy here in our communities with the resources that we have. And, you know, we are again, not to work from a, a deficit framework but from an asset framework we are the descendants of kings and queens we built civilizations we were the first to have a written language we were the first to devise architecture and science and agriculture right so we got to remember that that's who we are and we got to deploy that in this moment uh oh Bernice, you i started feeling the the, the energy coming rising up rise up stand up Bernice. Oh, that's a whole different level of conversation you're trying to have there. So that's real talk that Bernice just had. I'm, so I'm going to talk about my real quickly that comment I made about uh, Jackie's uh, 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 blog. I said in the response to her, make what kind of happen now. That was, my, that was my full response. So you speaking that truth, truth, Bernice, we don't have to, we're talking about fighting for environmental justice. We're fighting against stuff, against stuff. Environmental justice is also about fighting for something, community building. So how are we doing that, y'all? So that's the, that's the power of the network. How can you build? How can you grow? How can you build these, I'm going to say, not ecotopias, the Afrotopia, the Wakanda you just outlined? Because you're exactly right. As someone who's a futurist, science fiction, fantasy futurist myself, we can make all that happen if we focus our own assets. Move away from what's wrong and stay on what's right. Move away from, from the hate, get over there, and move towards love and hope, right? So I'm gonna stop talking because uh, that was that was that was deep, Bernice, and I'm glad you I'm glad you 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 said what you said. I appreciate all the pounds and what what y'all said to this point. If I give y'all another question, we're gonna go overtime. So y'all fine with me going to? <laughs> uh, let me give y'all a, a close out, and then we go to Q and A. Are y'all fine with that? Because we're supposed to end at yes. I'm supposed to close this out at three fifteen. Yes. So can you can you give me your solutions in like? Because I know all y'all are icons, and, and, and Peyton's an up-and-coming icon. So we can be here for a whole other hour. Give me, like, your lightning solutions in about 30 seconds, and then we'll do some Q&A for the last uh, 10, 10, 12 minutes. Go ahead. Who wants to go first? I'll go first. Okay, go ahead. My first, so I have a couple. I'll go really fast. And I said one already this morning. Vote and uh, vote for um, people who are going to put you first, you being the public and not the profit, right? And that's what we need to do. And part of voting is registering and being careful, being safe and all of those things. But knowing, checking to make sure you are registered, checking your, um, your, your polling location, uh, um, volunteer to be a poll judge. Um, I've tried to do that. Right now they're saying they have too many um, volunteers. I've never heard that before because I thought the issue was that there weren't enough, but okay. Um, and, and aside from that, when it comes to working with organizations, stand up and step out and, um, you know, demand partnership. 
And that means just what Omega and Brenda Wilson were talking about. Have um, memorandum of understanding, memorandum of agreements, right? Put those in place so that everybody is clear on what's expected. Therefore, in that way, people aren't doing to you. They're doing with you, right? And in some instances, it can be guided by you. And I think that that's important. Identify where you need, um, a, you know, where you need information, where there are data gaps. And that can be through an EJ analysis or an assessment or whatever, but be in charge, step up. You know, and recognize you don't have to have all the de degrees and in initials behind your name to care about what's going on in your community. So that was short. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Let's go to uh, let's go to Peggy. Let's go to Peggy next. Sure. I think Black Lives Matter has shown us the power of continuing to to be out front, to advocate, to stay in people's faces, to do the kind of protest and direct action night after night, month after month. That's why we are where we are today. And where are we today? We are with a national debate and dialogue on, on racial disparities. Um, what do we need? We've got to develop capacity in our organizations. You know, I am, am convinced, I'm committed to, to movement building. There's not one environmental justice organization or one organization that can do it all. If we're not all strong, hundreds of us across the country, we yeah. cannot create the change we need. So I'm committed to helping to build coalitions and networks to provide that kind of capacity building and uh, technical assistance. And I think the other thing we, we've really got to think about is, is how we hold uh, our elected officials accountable. Uh, we Act has just started a C4 organization so that we can do more political work, more lobbying work, more endorsements. Even a small block association can hold their elected officials accountable. We are not doing that and we must do that. We've got communities where you've got an AOC who's progressive and is thinking proactively and then we've got communities like some in Harlem where we still have the old timers recycling positions and trying to hold on to power. We must force them out. We must start raising up the Peyton Wilkins and the younger folks who are emerging leaders to do this kind of work and to be our new emerging leaders and our new elected leaders. So again, we've got to be more politically active We've got to hold our folks accountable. No, thank you for that. That C4 angle is really, really important. Holding politicians accountable. So not just having the, you know, 501c3, but having your, your sister, brother, 501c4. And then this young folks engaging, I, I really think it's really, really important. Uh, and I'm glad you said that, Peggy. I want to, I want to go to, before I go to uh, Vernice next, I want us to give a quick shout out on the young, for, young folks point. Uh, 70 Peace and Justice was one of our student organizations that uh, that's on campus. Yan is the president. You know, we're talking about young folks being engaged in the political process. They're being trained. They're training uh, members uh, to be poll judges, right? So that's one way of getting young folks involved in the political process. You know, we we have to do that, y'all. And it's just and, and again, like I said before, it's just about voting. You got to vote. You got to be there and vote. But then you got to do you got to do the work after you vote too, right? So go go ahead, and Vernice. Give give us your like your 30 seconds elevator. So, Me or Peyton? Oh, 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 oh go, go ahead, uh, Peyton. You, oh, Vernice wants to close out. Okay, go, go, go ahead. Oh, cool. I, I'll be as brief as possible in the economy of time. Uh, you, you know, uh, all this Afrofuturist talk got me thinking about Octavia Butler and Earthships yep. and Parables of the Sower. Um, yep. And, and uh, that's not the, the policy that I think needs to really be implemented. It's something that breaks us away from this capitalist structure or this capitalist model of education uh, where we're depositing information in the students so that they can uh, regurgitate it. We need to replace it with something that is based on critical thinking, that develops critical thinking through dialectic dialogues, um, a pedagogy that actually actually uh, uh, teaches us to challenge the status quo. Um, and, and I don't see how we get to any form of a true liberation um, without a, a proper foundation of education. And I'm sorry for all those shouldn'ts at the end. Mm -mm -mm. Uh, Rock uh, that, Peyton. Rock uh, hey, young bro, ain't nothing wrong with that. I, I was trying to get a proposal pushed through the University of Maryland, and uh, it had in there the Liber Liberation Arts Institute. That's the idea. So what you just outlined 
was the Liberation Arts Institute. Film, music, you know, hip hop, literature, science fiction, right? And so we, we can make we can make Wakanda happen. I'm gonna be quiet. Go ahead, Bernice. So I'm I I want to end on a, a a smaller frame, but I think none nonetheless important, and that's self care. Um, in this moment and in this time of a global pandemic, um, that we really have to take care of ourselves and we really have to take care of each other. So. When I was at the Ford Foundation, a big part of my grant making was to do general support funding. And my average colleague had about 25 grantees and I had 65 or 70 grantees every, um, every year. And the reason for that is because I gave people general support um, uh, grants, which was the hardest money for nonprofits to raise. And the purpose behind that general support funding was so that people could have health insurance, that they could have paid sick leave, that they could go on vacation. Um, uh, EJ people tend to work themselves to death, literally. And they usually die before their time. Um, and, you know, it's hard. You, 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 you just don't see us just aging out and retiring because we work so hard and the things we work on are so important. And, and the people we're working on behalf of, we just cannot stop doing that work. So I want to just recommend that people think about taking care of themselves. And to that end, um, I know it's going to make her crazy, but um, at the beginning of the pandemic, like in April, <laughs> Dr. Hollis said to me, um, you need to fix up your deck. And I said to her, you have your own deck. Why are you worried about my deck? And she said, because as a scientist, she said to me, because I don't think you're going anywhere. I know you think you're going to the Bahamas to see your family, but you are not. You are not leaving your backyard. And you need to really just figure out your space and figure out what you can do to make sure that you can hold down in that space. So I did, and I worked outside all summer and it saved my soul. It saved my life. Um, being out there in the sun all the time, we're a sun people, so we need to be outside, um, but it made it possible for me to do the work. I was so productive this summer. I wrote and published more things than I have done in a really long time because I was taking care of myself in the midst of a pandemic. And any movement, any social movement needs people who are in good mental space and good spiritual space and good physical space. And we, if we don't know it, if we didn't know it before, we have to know it now. They are coming for us, right? And so we need to be as strong as we can be to lift each other up. But first that starts with taking care of yourself. Wear the damn mask. I don't care if it fogs up your glasses. Wear the mask, right? Don't be out with people. Um, do the things that, uh, that Dr. Fauci tells us to do. Eat right, get rest, right? And get ready for the revolution that's coming because we are in it and they are coming for us. Oh yeah, just to, just to show y'all real quick, some of y'all know this already. I bought myself a trombone. <laughs> I've been playing. I've been playing along James Brown. That's what I've been doing. And also, I got a micro farm. Everything but counting chicken outside. So self care is important. I just want to show y'all. Just like it's real, y'all. So uh, let's take these. Th let's take our panelists. We're gonna we're gonna take some questions. But I really, this is a power. I, I love the fact that y'all closed out the day strong. I appreciate my fam. Y'all doing great work individually, collectively. And, and I just want to just want to show appreciation to y'all. Uh, and so thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, and then hopefully the, the folks who are attending, y'all just put the claps, put the claps in or, or do the do the thumbs up for the uh to show appreciation to the panelists. And this trombone is heavy, by the way. Uh, okay. So <laughs> the first so first question from the audience. Or well, you can put it in the chat. Yeah, put the thumbs up in the chat. So first question to the audience, uh, I mean, for, to the panel from the audience. So uh, Eric Coker asked on this issue of media, that the media is not really looking at these converging, uh, pe converging pandemics. Why can't we get a CNN town hall on environmental injustice and racism? You know, why, why, is, why has it been so, the, the lack of media coverage or the shyness to really talk about racism, you know, when it comes to this viral pandemic and these other issues uh, that, that, that black folks, indigenous folks, other people of color are dealing with. Uh, uh, Dr. Hollis, can you chime in that first? Yeah, I can talk um, a little bit about that um, in terms of um, working with the media or getting the media to, um, 
to sort of see what's going on. Because, you know, I mentioned earlier that it seemed like the media lost interest because, of course, um, blood gets more views, um, which is why you said the, the trauma of seeing um, Mr. Um, Floyd, you know, was um, probably viewed more times than the hurricane, right? Um, so one of the things that, um, and, and to answer the question, we all need to be doing something. It's a great idea. Let's act on it, right? We're trying to reach out to, uh, plan to reach out to like the weather station to see if we can get an environmental justice segment on there. You know, same thing with CNN. You see Mustafa on there all the time. Jackie's on there. You know, we have people. We just need more people and we need to support the people that are on there. We have Joy Reid, right? Let's, you know, let's work through the people that we know who, you know, who might, who would be interested in something like this, who talked about things like this. I'm actually giving a talk on Friday and I wasn't going to, but then when I looked them up and saw who it was, it's a um, ethnic media um, uh, company, um, ethnic media group talking about why, uh, when it comes to ethnic issues, it's not the focus of mainstream media, right? So that we take this to, um, you know, where we can get it. And, and just like you said, everybody's been blogging and writing. Let's get that out there. You have a wonderful journal, um, Environmental Justice. Let's get some articles published there, right? Let's get more things put out there. I'm, I'm, I'm open. Y'all send them to me. Send them my yes. way. <laughs> That's right. Op-eds, you guys. Write a letter to the editor. Put, you know, make your voice heard. And instead of coming up with ideas and wondering why they aren't done, let's do them. Let's do them together. You know, if you think of something good, that's part of that's part of the action. Next thing is to act on it and that way for other people to act on it. That's what we've been doing for too long. And it's for us to be the actors. Exactly. Who else I don't know if that addresses it. No, thank you, thank you. Who okay. else wants to jump in on that question? Well, I'm gonna put Peggy on the spot because Peggy's actually a trained journalist uh, from Howard University, y'all. Howard, um, HU, uh, an actual bison. Um, and Peggy taught me the, the importance of controlling that narrative. Um, amazingly, we have gotten a lot of um, media attention in the last, since uh, George Floyd's uh, murder. Um, but again, we haven't gotten the, the sustained media, we haven't gotten television, um, but we've gotten a lot of social media, I think. Um, and of course, a lot of our folks, you know, and let me ask you, Peyton, you know, I've got a lot of young staff and young people don't have televisions. Young people don't have televisions. They're watching everything on a computer. And so when you have to click on something before you read it, are you really seeing the, the span uh, of news that's out there? And I think that's one reason why our folks don't have, you know, all, the whole country doesn't have the kind of information they need. You know, when it used to be looking at a newspaper, you know, you flip through pages, but you'd see stuff you might not want to read, but then you might say, oh, you know, well, maybe I'll take a look at this on the business page. But when you can click on it on the computer, you really aren't looking at stuff. So. We've really got to think about the new way of communication. Um, you know, videos are more important. Uh, podcasts are getting important. So really thinking about how we utilize media. But again, we also have to, uh, to continue to try to make inroads uh, into media. For instance, CBS said that they were going to do something on, on Louisiana, and they invited me to, to talk about EJ. And I thought it was going to be on, it was supposed to be on CBS News. It ended up being on CBS News Online. Online. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that was disappointing because I thought, well, finally, environmental justice is going to make prime time. Um, you know, with real video showing communities, showing people in a community um, and showing the conditions and the challenges. And, and that didn't quite happen. So we've got to continue to push and we've got to push on the people of color who are now in these positions like a Don Lemon and a Joy Reid. And um, you're absolutely right. And MBJN needs to, to make that push. And I, I know we're uh, in a position to begin to do that. No, th thank you for that, for, that, for that great response. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get, we're, we're, about, we're basically run, running out of time. So, I want to see if I can get a couple more quick comments. What, what about foundations? 
Oh, okay. uh, the Robert Johnson Kreskin Kellogg on the climate and environmental justice front. Mm -hmm. Is that working out for us? Uh, are there some successes there? Uh, is the private sector a place that's supposed to be Denise, looking? let me just say this one thing before you start. $28 billion a year in philanthropy for environment. 1% goes to environmental justice. So I'll let you take it from there, Bernice. And, and that's why I said earlier that it's so important that we develop our own streams of, um, of financial support, um, uh, our own networks, our own cooperatives. Um, there is one, somebody asked what success what successes are out there. And this isn't necessarily on the environment side, John, but um, out of the University of Maryland, um, there has been an effort called um, the Democracy Collaborative. Um, uh, one of its founders has moved to Cleveland because one of their biggest pilots is in Cleveland, but it's to bring the, the Mondragal um, uh, notion of community cooperative back um, into communities and it's going really successfully in, in Cleveland and the Cleveland Community Foundation is a big partner, the Cleveland Clinics are a big partner, but communities are owning and building their own businesses and they're taking over all the back office activity for the Cleveland Clinic. The Cleveland Clinic is one of the most famous um, and one of the wealthiest um, medical research institutions in the United States. But they used to farm all of that back office business out to other folks. And so now black folks and Latino folks and working class white folks are building and owning those businesses. And that money is coming back to them in that community so that they can hire other people. That's just one model. But we've got to come up with models, Peggy, I think that are other than the philanthropic model or the philanthropic model that has that has supported the nonprofit sector in the United States because I think it's changing and I think there's some really innovative and progressive voices within philanthropy that are really trying to make it change. But at the end of the day, it's still about white white wealth, right? And about generational wealth. And that in and of itself has inherent issues around systemic racism. And so liberation for me is about controlling my own space, right? I own the house that I live in. Um, I own the land that my house is on. As Oprah once said, buy land, because God ain't making no more of that, right? We have to go back to collective areas of ownership. We have to, you know, we're fighting in the District of Columbia. We've already lost this battle in Harlem about owning at least the land that we organize and operate and live on. Um, that gentrification piece is really powerful in terms of how people are getting displaced and where we build those economic models at. But we have to think deeper and bigger, I think, Peggy. Um, and we have to think about ownership and collective ownership. And, 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 and that means we have to challenge our own notions about materialism and acquisition of things, right? And my daddy used to talk to me all the time about um, long-term gratification or delayed gratification, which is a phrase that I don't think people even talk about anymore. But my daddy used to talk to me about that all the time. Um, and what are you willing to invest now so that you can have what you want later, right? What are you willing to sacrifice for now? Um, I remember when I was in college, I was food insecure the whole time I was there. I was really thin in college and people look at pictures of me and they say, oh my God, Renee, she was so thin. I was like, cause I ate once a day, right? And that's what I had to do. And I didn't complain about it. I didn't bitch about it. I said, this is what I need to do to be at this institution, to get this degree, to move forward and do the things that I wanna do. I consciously made those sacrifices. And I think we, we are in a place where socially, politically, culturally, sacrificing for ourselves, for our families, for our communities is something that we are just not, um, we are not as committed to that as we once were. And sacrificing for each other is what's going to get us out of this thing that we're in right now. Wear the mask. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That's a great way to close uh, this session. I want to again show appreciation to our, to our panelists on the syndemic to appreciate for talking about the great work of the National Black Environmental Justice Network. Y'all can go to www.nbejn.com uh, to join. We, it's for black folks, but if you're an ally, if you're not black, you can also join NBEJN. So please, if you're about environmental justice, if you're about social justice, join the network. Uh, and just so before you close out a few announcements, I want to again thank uh, the students who helped organize uh, this 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 um, this symposium. This is the first day, y'all. So we got three more days. September 26th, 
uh, October 3rd and October 10th. Next week, uh, we will have the highlights will be, uh, I think it's the ninth annual uh, Siege Lecture, uh, which will be done by uh, NBA EJN's own, uh, NWCP's own uh, Jackie Patterson, who will be the keynote lecturer. And, and, and lecturer, and then we're going to have uh, a state and re, uh, report back panel on what the state agencies and county agencies are doing to uh, advance environmental justice in this state. So again, I, I want to thank the student organizers again, Michael, uh, Salim, Sakura. Uh, I want to thank Rami and, and, uh, and Summer. Also thank uh, Joe for his his help. Also want to thank our sponsors, particularly again Sierra Club, uh, and also want to thank UCS and other sponsors. Uh, and also, I want, as, as, as Peggy and some others mentioned, uh, I think maybe Peggy mentioned, a uh, panelist mentioned, hey, we got the Environmental Justice uh, a Journal. I mean, we have special issues for y'all to on, on the pandemic, on Hurricane Katrina in the Gulf Coast. We got one on right now, Energy Justice, that just came out. We got a special issue specific for the symposium. It's not just about original research papers. You got policy brief. You got impact papers, community voice papers. If you want to do an editorial commentary, you can also write that and submit. So let's, let's uplift that journal and make that journal be the voice uh, for this social movement. So I really, again, want to close out thanking everybody again for participating. And please uh, attend next week and, and spread the word uh, about, uh, about the symposium. So folks can send out the link. Again, you can put the link in the chat. You can go to www.cejhlab.org. And you, can, and you can go to the registration link from there. Remember, this event is free. And, and, and knowledge is power. So let's empower ourselves to advance environmental justice. Uh, thanks, everybody. Y'all take care. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thank you, Dr. Wilson. Great You're day. You're welcome. Bye-bye. See you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye, Don't forget that self-care, folks. Don't forget that self-care. Great job. Sakobi, great job. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Thanks for thanks for all the work. <laughs>